Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of the Manufacturing Transformed podcast. I'm your host, Paul Van Meter, and uh, today we are releasing uh, just a really wonderful and warm uh, and insightful conversation with James Marzilli of Marzilli Machine, uh, a great shop in Boston. James has been, or Jamie, as I call him, as his friends call him, uh, has been a client for a number of years now and truly had a significant transformation when he he brought on Pro Shop. You know, he had run his shop for, I think, about eight years before uh, he got Pro Shop. He and his wife had, um, and, uh, you know, doing the best they can. He was a machinist for years before that, so knew the industry, but didn't quite honestly know a lot about running a machine shop, running the business. And uh, although his wife has, you know, Lee has really strong business skills, the actual nuts and bolts of the machine shop itself were were somewhat somewhat new to them, uh, even though they tried for years. And his description of having Pro Shop be like taking a college level course on how to actually run a pro sh uh, machine shop properly was the first I'd heard of that kind of term, um, but a really interesting way to frame it. And he goes on to describe uh, just lots of uh, really interesting things about way he thinks about building process and teams and continuous improvement and just going for things. And and uh, it's been really fun to watch his shop flourish and grow over the last several years. And he's about to move into a significantly larger facility. Uh, so very excited. So anyway, please enjoy this great uh, in-person uh, episode of Manufacturing Transformed. Jamie, so glad you're here with me. Pleasure to be here, Paul. So um, you are uh, guest number two on the Manufacturing Transformed podcast, which, as I was saying, is similar in some ways to when you were on Machine Shop Mastery, but this is truly about Pro Shop. Okay. So we don't need to have any any topics sort of off limits and keeping that arm's length um, that we do with Machine Shop Mastery. So I'd love to have you share a little bit about the background of Marzilli Machine, um, and then we'll get into uh, why you needed a new system, how you chose Pro Shop, and sort of what it's been like since. But sure. Let's start with the story of the shop. So I've been a machinist since I was 15 years old. I'm 43 now. I went to trade school for it. I uh, was very good at it. I always made a good living doing it. And, you know, like a lot of machinists out there, a lot of frustration, um, you know, especially as things were changing and dynamic milling was taking place and we were moving from the slow way of doing things to the faster way. You know, there was a lot of resistance from the old guard yeah. and I was banging my head against that a lot. Sure. And uh, my wife kind of challenged me to start my own business. And so I did. Um, I yeah, I I love her. And you know, it was <laughs> she's a good idea. Awesome. Yeah. She is. Yeah. And we run our business together. Yeah. Um, and she's good. She's got a master's in business and she takes care of all the admin side. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I take care of production and everything that has to happen on that side. I build out the systems. Yeah. It's a good partnership. It is. It works well. I'm very lucky. Uh, now that I've um, kind of been getting out in the world and traveling and meeting other shop owners, I realize now how lucky I really am that I don't really have to worry about that side of the business. And, you know, she's just as deep into it as I am. So she's got just as much to lose if if she's not very competent at her job as, as if I wasn't at mine. Right. And how long has it been? It will be 13 years this year. Okay. 13 years. And um, you implemented another system uh, years earlier than you came to Pro Shop. Can yes. Just share a little bit about that and why ultimately you decided that wasn't the, the right system for the rest of your future. Sure. Um, so we, at one of the places that I worked at right before I started my own shop, they had job loss and they, they were using that. And, you know, I was in my late twenties, early thirties, and I had been in a lot of other shops that didn't even have, right. you know, what they were doing. And when I started my own, I said, you know, I want to do it better and I want to do it right. And I want to have good systems. And so, I got into job loss and we, you know, we didn't know any better. So, you know, we thought we were doing it well and we used it to make travelers and, you know, data collection and that kind of stuff. Um, but truth, we needed something new because we just couldn't make profits. We, we were making money, okay, but we could not make, we could not make consistent profitability. Um, okay. And what do you attribute that to? Inefficiency. And, or time management. 
um, and not my personal time, but I'm a big believer that uh, manufacturing companies turn time into money and we just choose metal and plastic as the medium to do so. Mm -hmm. And so if you're bad at managing time, you're hence then bad at managing money. And so if you're constantly late, you know, you talk about this a lot about, you know, expedite fees and stuff, right? Sure. And that's um, a very tangible way of being of being like oh hey you know we're not in a, we're not efficient right now because sure. we're paying a lot of expedite fees and shipping fees and things like that and that's just bleeding off your profits right but that's because you see those real easily you know sure. those are easy line items on, on your p l yeah but what you have a lot of trouble seeing is hardware wasn't here when it was supposed to be and so this job didn't ship on time so we didn't make our number for the month because this job got pushed the next month and next month is a completely different thing than this month. And, you know, you only get one chance to make it right. And you got to, there's an infinite number of ways of making it wrong and being bad with managing logistics and logistics of time are why most shops have a lot of trouble making money, including, uh, including us. We just right. didn't know. Sure. So, you know, in the, in the modern machine shop article, the, the thing that people really picked up on, you know, is that you really have no idea how much waste you have until you start pointing at it and addressing it. And then you realize it's, it's so much more than what you think. Mm -hmm. And so you were living in that, that I call it that job boss world, not realizing quite how much inefficiency or waste you were doing every day because you're just in the thick of it. Yeah. Would you know? Yeah. You know, and then we got, we got hit really hard when the tariffs got put in place. Mm -hmm. And then we got hit pretty hard when COVID hit too. Right. And so, you know, the, honestly, I was thinking that I had, that it was time to do something else. That's mm -hmm. what I was thinking. And that we had been at it, you know, eight or nine years at that point. And it was not what I imagined when I got that first loan and started my business. It, none of it had gone that way. And I mean, my wife and I, we talked about it and we decided we were going to take one more crack at it, but we needed to figure out a way to do everything, to just do it differently. Okay. To just, we had nothing left to lose. So right. let's just do it differently. Right. Okay. And so then I started kind of doing research as to, well, what else was out there? Right. And I happened to stumble across uh, an article that uh, you had submitted, and I believe about another customer switching to uh, paperless. Okay. You know, the holy grail of manufacturing, right. um, you know, no paper inside your shop. Right. And uh, I happened to, I showed it to my wife and I was like, this is different. And I, I, people have been talking about this for 10 years and no one has done it. Um, heavy lift at the beginning like automation right sure. so it, it's hard to get it to go yeah and i said we have nothing to lose we might as well give it a shot and that was when you and i met mm -hmm. um and i was not easily convinced <laughs> um, sure. but as you shouldn't be no and i mean every everything that we had we had put into that shop everything yeah. you know our, yeah. our we signed our house on the line i gave up my, all of my 30s to build right. that company right and so we did not do it lightly, you know, and the devil, you know, is better than the devil. You don't. So even though it wasn't good and it wasn't running well, we had no idea what was going to happen if we just ripped it up and tried something new. Right. But I think we were in that perfect position where we were tired of the old and, and we were ready for change. Right. We were open-minded and we were ready for change. And so we embraced it wholeheartedly, like all the way, we went all the way in, Yeah. you know, instead of just being like, well, let's try it a little bit and let's see how it goes. I just took a completely different mentality. I told you the story about how I, I started threatening to fire people yeah. uh, for questioning the decision and that they, because once I started to understand what we had done, I, what I really understood was how much I didn't know. That was, that became unbelievably clear to me was that I knew almost nothing yeah. and, and that I had been doing this for a decade. Right. Um, and at other shops before that. Well, you work at other shops. No one teaches you how to, how to run the shop, how, to, how so the front end works. So it sounds like sort of the classic e-myth uh, story. You know, you talk about the e-myth book all the time. Mm -hmm. People that are masters at their craft are, think the myth is that if they're masters at the craft, they'll be good at running a business that does that. Yes. So you were probably the classic example. Of oh, that. I was was the poster child for that. Uh, <laughs> I ran my company poorly because I ran it like a machinist. And so how, what does that mean? Well, I took jobs in because I thought they were cool. Mm -hmm. I took jobs in because I enjoyed the challenge and I wanted to be able to prove that I could make it. Um, that's not the criteria that I take jobs in for now. Sure. Uh, I had to learn how to become a businessman. Right. Um, I was a machinist who had to learn how to become a businessman. 
Um, and now I'm a businessman and I'm an awful machinist now. I'm, I'm awful <laughs> I, at it, I doubt know. that's true. Uh, it's, I'm still very good at problem solving and programming and logistics and all the stuff that made me a good machinist. But right. when I go downstairs now and I try to help and I try to cut, it's a problem because um, there's so much going on and I can't just let go of everything and focus on the job like I'd sure, like to. Sure. And and who's going to come in and take over a machine that I'm working on, right? right. Like the boss is setting something up right. and then I get, you know, somebody shows up and I have to go take a meeting. I'm missing for three hours. They're right. making no money in that machine. Sure. Nobody's coming to take that over. They're all going, oh, that's Jamie's machine. Don't just leave that be. He'll come back eventually. <laughs> that's funny. So do you attribute your implementation of ProShop as to for learning how to be a businessman or there must have been. No, I think, I think my, I think my failures, I think my failures are what made me a better businessman. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think my implementation of pro shop is what made me a better machine shop owner. Okay. Was, there are no books on how to do this. And everybody's situation is a little bit different. You know, you go and you ask somebody for advice and if they're second or third generation owner, their experience is very non-relevant to what I had done. Mm. Um, and, you know, my shop is very unique because I'm a machinist owner, sure. which you don't see a lot. And that's getting to be less and less and less. A lot of our, a lot of our competitors and our allies are being bought up by venture capital. They're second, third generation. They're, you know, people who are in banking, who are deciding they want to get into manufacturing. Um there are not a lot of machine shops that are kind of popping up organically, mm -hmm. you know, where, you know, a guy just said, and I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It definitely happens, sure. but um, it, it should be happening more. And that's something I, I actually right. think that I might be able to make a difference on. Oh, nice. My experience of coming up, learning it the hard way and how to become a businessman. I think it's something I might be able to share and, and help other younger entrepreneurs to get there faster and not make the same mistakes. Is that uh, just an aside? Is that one of the reasons you're one of the the Titans shops? Yes. Yeah. Yep. That's why That's awesome. we and we we brought that the Titans of CNC Academy in to help us to grow our own people organically because right. it's a curriculum that it's a curriculum they can do at home, and you know one of the things I that makes me successful at this is is my tenacity, um, you know, and and my confidence that I I can get myself out of trouble mm -hmm. and. That is something unique to my personality. So we have to find that in other people. Like you need tough people. You know, if you if you if you can't be a tough person, and then I need you to hold something plus or minus a thou, and you've got one piece of material, right? You know, you, that's you know, you could have a panic attack over that if you <laughs> if you really understand the consequences of it and the yeah. dollar values attached to it. So Absolutely. you got to be able to take those kinds of punches. So sure. what we do at our shop with that is we. We just make it available to everyone. We make those opportunities available. We don't force anyone. Yeah. And we have them do some of it at home on their own time. You know, and if they don't have a computer, if they don't have the ability, we let them do it at the shop at their own time. But mm -hmm. it's important for me that they invest a little bit in themselves. Sure. Because the ones who invest a little bit in themselves, then I come over the top and I invest tons of time, my time, training, material, tooling, money, everything into those people. And they end up becoming really, really great machinists where I've learned that the ones that I try to force them to do it, right? you know, even if they're asking me for it, sure. they're saying, you know, hey, I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to advance. And I just give it to them. They don't appreciate it. And so they don't understand the value of what it is I've just taught them. Sure. And and then they end up going and chasing dollars and not chasing talent. And they end up getting pigeonholed into, into a job. Maybe they like it. Maybe they don't. But Sure. Um, you know, and a lot of other shop owners, I'm sure can attest to this. They get a guy that shows up for an interview and the guy's been doing it 10, 15 years and he can't even explain true position to you. Right. You know, you wonder how did this guy, you know, who's paying this guy 30 bucks an hour? He doesn't know how to drill the hole, sure. you know, and you, that's right. how that happens. You know, he just right. was like, yeah, I'm doing good. I'm making good money. And then that place closes up or slows down and he ends up out in the labor market and realizes that he doesn't have the talent to compete in sure. today's labor market because it's not the way it used to be, mm -hmm. you know? It's good insights. Um, so, well, I want to get back to employees and and uh, it's your show, Paul. Let's do it your way. <laughs> <laughs> how they, you know, how they adopted a pro shop. But I do want to go back and talk just about um, selecting pro shop and the implementation process. Sure. Which I know that you're candid with people. Sucks. Well, I'll. Yeah. 
Yes. Um, well, I'll start with the first question, um, which is something that, you know, I think you should be incredibly proud of. Uh, not that I need to toot your horn at all, but um, I bought Pro Shop because of you. So I talked to three other people before you called me, not from other companies, from your company. Okay. Who were telling me, you know, selling it to me. Right. And I'm just not that kind of a buyer. I'm a, I, I need technical answers to technical questions. You're talking about blowing up my business yeah. and rebuilding it. And so I want to know how it works. And mm -hmm. so I got a phone call from you, a Zoom call, and I, I think we spent three hours. Um, and now that I'm, you know, bigger and I employ like 25 people now and, you know, three hours of your time, I understand today how valuable that really is. Mm -hmm. Where then I was like, this guy's trying to sell me something. He'd better spend three hours of his time <laughs> explaining it to me. Sure. Um, but after after I had talked about it with you and you had the ability to answer my questions, like no matter how deep I went, you understood your product. So I felt comfortable that if I got stuck, somebody would be able to help me. Mm -hmm. And and it, what I was doing wasn't working. Right. So, you know, sometimes I, I don't need everything. I just needed to feel comfortable. Right. And that was why I bought it. You know, I, I knew digi going digital and getting rid of the paper was the answer. Right. And then I felt these are this is a group of people who will help me, right. you know, and, and that's and honestly. And again, you know, this. I buy a lot of softwares. We we added it up and we're well over sixty thousand dollars a year in software fees and maintenance fees and all this other stuff. Because uh, we're pretty far ahead in industry 4.0 from a lot of other shops. So I have three or four, could even be up to five now, of different softwares that manage different things inside the shop. Sure. And out of all of them, the customer service at ProShop is a different experience. In fact, it sets the bar at an unrealistic level. Mm -hmm. So then you're very upset with other companies <laughs> when they don't just handle it for you the way that it gets handled sure. with ProShop. And I think you guys have done a good job of scaling that because I understand that when you when you first onboarded me, you know, you guys were a lot smaller than where you are now That's in true. client count. And so you could give me that really personal, hey, Paul, this is broken. You know, and as you guys began to grow, you built a good system with the ticket system. So I still feel like I'm being taken care of. And I never text you about technical problems anymore. Sure. And everything just keeps rolling. And that's how come I always volunteer for the beta. Um it's because you need people to give you good, honest feedback. And I'm, I feel really good that if something goes wrong, you guys respond very quickly, right? And it's, mm -hmm. it's how you pick yourself up. It's not about how you fall down. So, sure. so that's why I that's why I pulled the trigger. Okay. Um, what was the second part of your question? Um, the crew? The implementation part. Yeah. So the implementation, um, I mean, it's awful, right? You're taking... It's a spinal cord replacement. Yeah. Perfect. It's a spinal cord replacement with trillions of connections. And, yeah. and we were a baby of a company. So a lot of things were not built. And some of those things weren't even in my imaginations that we were going to build them. Mm -hmm. And as we were getting uh, Luke did our onboarding yep. and we kept running into like, he would train us to, this is how this is going to work. And this is how these things attach. Right. So everything's digital. Everything can link together. So everything's at your fingertips. And I'd be like, well, I don't, I don't have this. And he's like, yeah, but look at how cool it would be if it did it like this and you could put it all together. Right. Sure. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, it sounds like a lot of work and I don't know. <laughs> so I, you know, I think of the tool crib. Um, I love that story. Can you with, tell a story? Sure. Sure. So uh, he was teaching me about planning and how planning and making your setup sheets digitally, how that goes. And he kept saying, about all of the cool things that you could do and how you link everything together back to the tools in the tool crib. Yeah. And I kept saying, we don't have a tool crib because we were very small. We we're five machines, you know, maybe there was 12 right. people working there. Yeah. Um, which is interesting to think of now because now we we were almost double, almost tripled in size. Right. Since we had put Pro Shop in place. Sure. So finally I, I just said, you know, send me some pictures of what what it is you're describing about how the tool should tool crib should get put together and like by the third time that he was like this thing links to the tool crib and i'm like yeah, i don't have the tool crib finally i said you know what i'm doing i am i am being the problem i am the problem in my company i have to tell myself that all the time okay it's me i'm i'm being stubborn right and then so that was on uh when i did my onboarding i took it uh, like a college level 
of course. So me and Luke did, I, I don't know if I have the record, but I'm close. So I did my onboarding in six weeks. Yeah. I did three times a week, two hours, a class plus two yeah. hours of homework. Two and I, hours a week. And I took it very seriously. And I always showed up with my homework done. Yeah. And Start that Friday, day. he was like, you know, we're going to miss out on a lot of stuff. You know, can't you just go get like 10 tools and put it together so we can pretend you have a tool crib. Mm -hmm. And I said, all right, let me, let me, let me think about it. And I'm like, man, he's right. And I should, I should just stop resisting altogether. I should just let it happen. And then I came in on Saturday morning and I picked up the shipping department uh, with pallet jacks and stuff. And I moved yeah. it to, an, I moved it outside. And then I went and grabbed everyone's toolboxes. And I re I took a couple of our old list of cabinets we had. Yeah. And I started making them look like the pictures that he sent me. And yeah. we came up with our own system for numbering. We didn't use the organic system. Yeah. And our so like when you pick up a tool in my in my shop, it tells you what it is and where it belongs by its tool number. Nice. So you know the it's a five digit code with a letter in the front, so that tells you if it's a shop end mill, what cabinet goes into, and then what bin location it's in, just by looking at the tool number. Okay. Um. So when I came, I put that whole thing together, and I got like one draw done. Mm -hmm. There was a, there were thousands of tools, and yeah. so. I took a picture of it and I texted it to Luke and I was like, all right, let's go back to Wednesday's notes. Okay. How did these things work? How did that work? And then that set the precedent of me just going, I got to just let go. You know, I've, right. I've already paid the money. I'm in, I'm putting all my time into this. I got to let go. And as soon as I made that commitment to letting go, I'll, it began to flow real fast and I just stopped fighting it. And what I realized was, I had been complaining for years that no one writes a book on how to build and start a machine shop. And Luke was literally teaching me how to do it. Right. And so we began moving so quickly that most of our conversations that we had were about how to build a machine shop strategically, because the modules are all very similar. So if you learn how to make an estimate, you learn how to make a quote, you you know how to build a part. It's almost sure. it's identical, right? Yeah. And work orders are just demand based off of the part levels. Yeah. So how how you go to find everything and how you put everything together is very intuitive. So I didn't need a lot of hand holding with the software itself. Mm -hmm. And I was significantly more fascinated by how did you guys do this at Pro CNC? How did you handle this? Bought a box. Like I learned a lot. You know, yeah, and, yeah. and I whatever, you know, we were very space confined. Sure. So I took what I could. And implemented it right away and whatever else i kept a notebook which i still have and we're actually we i don't agree with bar box that's <laughs> okay that that's just because i don't agree with um the bar part everything else though oh, I, sure. I really liked the one piece flow concept correct and sure. when uh so we're moving yeah um where we got a, a space about four times the size of our current space i just poured brand new concrete floors congrats uh because the floor is the I've always wanted a nice, clean, smooth floor yeah. and nice, clean, painted walls in my shop because we're in like an oversized garage. I, When I started the company by myself, I never imagined we'd get to where we are. And I had to come up with a new dream. Right. And so my dream, I had to change it from, uh, I, I figured when I made a million dollars, you know, when I made a million dollars in gross product, I'll have made it. Uh, and then that came and went. Sure. And I'm not even I'm not even close to making it, you know, because the I moved the, the, the goalposts as I learned more. Yeah, yeah. As I learned what like real success means. And to me now, real success is building a company that can survive without me, that I'm proud to hand down to my kids, mm -hmm. and I'm not giving them a mess. That's that's what I'm worried about. That's beautiful. I yeah. don't want to hit, you know, this is my legacy. This is gonna become my family's legacy. And the people who work there they're a part of this too. And we treat them that way. And, and I truly believe in that, that it's as much their company now as it is mine. I'm never going to get to, our goal is to get to 20 million and to have a hundred people. Nice. I'm not going to get there by myself. Sure. And there'll be more money than I could ever spend. And so it's all of us together. We're all pushing in the same direction, trying to make this happen. And so to get back to, you know, to how their this, how this went for them as we were implementing, sure. there was a lot of resistance. Right. A lot of resistance um, because I was doing it so fast, uh, yeah, you know, six in, in six, six fast. weeks. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I, I felt like we had to rip the bandaid off and, and that was March of 2020. So they were like closing down the country and yeah. we got a PPP grant from the government. And so I had this unique opportunity in time where I had like two months that we could breathe. Right. And I was like, now's the, it's now or never. 
Yeah. You know, I have these people working here. We didn't have a lot to do. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, you, there's 3000 tools. I need you to take a picture of everyone. You have to fill out all this information and you need to make a little bin. Yeah. And then I, and I just kept going, you, this is how shipping works. It needs to be organized. You have to go into every customer level and fill in all of the, you know, you made this cool video about all these post-it notes. Yeah. We had that. Right. Like, it was just, they were everywhere. <laughs> and so we had to gather them all. Sure. So we had to gather them all and 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 parse through them what was pertinent, what was garbage, yeah. and and just kind of rebuild, you know, um, smarter. But as we started trying to look at, you know, do we rebuild what we currently have and, and make it better? It ended up being obvious that the best thing to do was just kind of start from scratch. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that was March, April, May. So by the end of May, I took. I, I took every active, uh, they call them travelers in job boss. Yeah. And I made, I just made dummy work orders in pro shop. Okay. And then we went around the shop and we just threw away every, all of the paper. Right. And we just, and then as those kind of bled out, we got into the real estimates that had the real data and then we never looked back. And then the following year, which we just got to print up in modern machine shop magazine. Again, we put out 64% more gross product with the same equipment, with the same people. Right. Right. So that's what I mean by you have no idea, no idea how much inefficiency you really have. Sure. Until you start to address it and you start to open your mind and, and see what else, you know. And so at that point, I made a decision that uh, it was time for me to become a learn it all, mm -hmm. you know, not a know it all, but a sure. learn it all. And sure. start kind of now I go in a lot of anytime I get invited to another shop or to uh, a trade show or yeah. I go. I, and my wife comes with me and we go together and we go to learn what's coming out, what's new. And we take that stuff and we bring it back to the crew and we teach it to them. Hey, right. this is what we see coming. You know, this is where, this is the direction we want to move in. And, and we've made, we've put a lot of new technology on the floor, you know, based on the feedback of the guys that are working there. Because what I ask them is how can I make your job better? Right. Right. And, and now they're all, now they're all pro shop. And so most of the, like the logistical problems, that's not what we ever, we're never talking about that kind of stuff anymore. Got it. You know, we're talking about, uh, I just bought a, a blue light scanning machine oh, nice! because oh, highly cool. complicated um, geometries take too long to measure in the CMM. Right. And so if it, if I, if I need a CMM program with like, you know, a couple of hundred different dimensions in it sure. for an in-process check, it just takes too long. You yeah. know, I'll make four or five more parts out of the machine before I get an answer back because this one's good. Right. We can scan it. We can scan thousands of dimensions in like five minutes. That's it awesome. takes the computer longer to process it than it does to scan it. So we had to get a really, really jacked up gaming computer. But it was, it was taking forever. It's fantastic. So one of the things you said, which I think is really fundamentally important, um, and we have clients hitting up against this philosophy, is having the humility um, and lack of ego to say, I'm just going to sort of let it go and follow the process and stop resisting mm. because I think there's, you know, when people start a business and they feel like they're an expert in their own business and they know how they've done things, it's hard to say, well, maybe I should throw away the way I've been doing things and mm. try something different. Um, like, yeah. What, what would be the, having done that and having um, gone through the process of just, going with the flow or however you know how to describe it, how would you, what kind of feedback or would you advice would you give to someone that's in that same position? Other than to trust the process. Um, it's tough because you're dealing with a lot of different personalities, you know, where, I, you know, I'm, I'm a lot younger than a lot of my peers who have made it this far in this space. Mm -hmm. I'm still one of the youngest guys, you know, even in my 40s now that in most of the meetings that I go into. Um, hmm. If you when you hire a lawyer, do you go there and give the lawyer advice or do you do what he tells you to do? Right. Right. So if you've spent, you know, a sizable amount of money. Sure. Um, to onboard with pro shop. And then you, these are experts in their field, just like a lawyer would be in his field. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make a lot of sense from a business perspective to not take the advice of the experts. Sure. You know, and I can, what I can attest to is that just in the four years since we've onboarded, 
I suspect that you guys have done the same thing. So now from you've gone from like 50 to hundreds of clients. And now you get into these, all these other companies and you get to learn how they tick and what's making them run better. Mm -hmm. And now you're catching the attention of OEMs. Right. And that, you know, and they're, they're giving you feedback saying, Hey, pro shop companies outperform, you know, they're, right. they're consistent, uh, they're predictable and that's what they want. Sure. And so you just go with it. You know, if you, right. if you took one step, you jump, just, right. just let it happen. Yeah. Uh, and it'll hurt the implement, the implementation can hurt a little bit, but there are ways to mitigate it. You know, um, who you pick as your pro shop champion is, is very important. Yeah. Um, I got lucky. That's me. Right. So like I didn't have sure. to negotiate with me. Yeah. Um, I'm also very lucky too that like my company is structured in a way where once I made the decision, it was done. Right. And not everybody has that. You know, some yeah. people have a lot of explaining to do. Um, sure. And I had no explaining to do. In fact, I, t I told you that funny story. How, um, as I was implementing it and we were changing so many different things and people were in my company were starting to resist. I started threatening to fire people right. because I didn't want to have to I shouldn't, I've taken these guys so far, right? you know, and they were just scared. That's what sure. they, they were just scared, scared yeah. of the unknown. They didn't yeah. know, you know, what was going to happen. Um, and the, in the example of the, of the, you know, the guy that I told him that if he didn't just trust me that he should go find a new job, what he was arguing about was that I had moved where the majority of the tools were from one place in the shop to the other. Okay. Right. And he was very upset that he was going to, and we have a 4,000 square foot building. I've worked at places that took me longer to walk from my car to the front door than if you made a complete lap around my shop. Okay. And he was complaining that we had moved the tools to the other side of the company and not where they were next to his machines. Right. And um, by the third time he had mentioned it, I had had enough. And and the the part of it that made me react in such a way was that what he couldn't understand was that he's never he's never going to have to go get his tools that they get delivered now. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I, I thought about that and I'm like, oh, this is going to be everybody's going to have this. Right. They're all going to have all these questions. Sure. And I don't want to come across as if like, you know, I was running it like a like a monarchy or anything. But what I, I said to them, wait until I'm done. Right. Wait until I'm done. I'll teach you guys how it works. Yeah. And then I want to hear what you guys think about it. Like that approach. But there's no reason in coming and complaining to me. The decision's been made. The money's been spent. Right. You know, and if you guys think I'm here taking college courses for, my, right. for me, I'm doing it for us. So stop fighting me and get on board because this is where we're going. Right. And I have a saying that we've said at the company since the day I started it. Be careful not to let the company outgrow you because we move at, an, at a ridiculous pace because I want to grow a multi-generational machine shop in my lifetime. Right. And so to do that, you have to be moving much faster than everybody else. And you have to be able to take, you know, reasonable risk, which is my wife is really good at this. I'm a dreamer, yeah. you know, and she's a realist. And so I'm like, look at all these crazy ideas. I want to try all this stuff. And she'll make sure that they add up. So that way I don't sure. just drive us off a cliff, you know, chasing yeah. something that's never going to come together. Yeah. Um. So she, make, she makes me a better owner. So I'm really glad that I have her. Um, yeah. And she and we're owners together. So I don't want to yeah, yeah. I don't want to misconstrue that in any way. But you after I after it was implemented and like a year goes by, right? I take a like a I take everybody out to dinner and we start talking about the change. Yep. What do you guys think? And everybody's like, we have no idea how we did anything before we did this. How did any of this stuff work? And I was like, it didn't. That was what. That was the point. That was why I had to do it. None of it worked. Right. That's why we weren't making any money. Right. And I can tell you that in 2021 and 2022, um, I made more profit than the previous nine years combined. And wow. and it gave my wife and I. Most years were break even years, right. you know. And I'm not. A lot of people who are going to listen to this, they're going to go, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Oh, I remember those years. You know, that break even. You're like, yay. Right. Oh, that's not too bad. Right. But uh, in 2021 and 2022, so that's the year, the year after we kind of like we knew about Pro Shop, I would say that it, it, 2021 is the year that everybody's talking about with the 64 percent. But then in 2022, um, we didn't grow. We just kind of, you know, did normal growth. Like I think it was 20 percent in growth product and we added a couple of machines. Yeah. But the profitability was huge. What a right. what a big difference. And finally, my wife and I were like, okay, this is a real business. Like you can really make money at this mm -hmm. if you can do it right. 
Um, but I don't want to give anybody any false ideas. It is even with Pro Shop, it is still like an engine. And so if you take one component out of the engine, it will sputter. Right. It won't, you'll get no performance out of it. So it's still a a battle of making sure it's fine-tuned, making sure our people are well-trained. Uh, now we're on a lot of like EOS type of stuff that we're kind yep. of focusing on, yep. um, getting rid of bad actors, you know, sure. um, culture, morale, that kind of thing, systems. I'm still, even from the, for, we did that pro, that um, podcast like two years ago, yeah. I'm still writing down systems constantly. Right. I feel like, I feel like we'll never stop. It's It's just something... My poor assistant. That's all he does. He just writes SOPs. Yeah, describe your what you do with your assistant. So I hired an assistant on your advice, um, and you were right. I definitely needed help, and uh, I hired this young man. His name is Cody. He's amazing, very bright young man, and very eager to learn about our world. And so I said, "Well, if you really want to learn about it, I need somebody to write down the instructions." And he's like, "The instructions for what?" So everything, every single thing. Every single thing that happens in here. Right. If you if you do anything in this place and you're like, oh, go ask Jamie how this works. When I explain it to you, write it down. I don't want to ever have to explain it to you again. Right. And then what we do is we take all of those SOPs. So the first SOP I wrote was how to write an SOP. So that way they would all come out the same. Yep. So I made an SOP for SOPs. And then what we'll do is we'll have meetings um, with department heads who are doing things, you know, per our ISO standards. But not in a really formalized, documented way because things are constantly evolving and changing. So we would just get together and I'd be like, hey, how does receiving work? You know, uh, how come I can't find the tracking numbers? You know, right. when, when I need to, somebody calls me, you know, I'm way up here. You guys are doing tracking numbers down here. How do I find them? Why do I have to come down and ask you? Mm -hmm. And so the, the trick to writing a good SOP is to come together in an agreement on what is the very first thing that happens. What when somebody says, okay, give me this info, what's the first thing you do? The absolute first thing you do. Yeah. And then how do you know when you're done? Okay. And then you just, you get everybody together and you just kind of let them fill in all the middle. And what you find out is that everybody has their own opinion on what the middle should look like. And some people have a different opinion on what the beginning looks like. Okay. Most people agree on when it's over. Yes. Um, but I give you a good example with the, um, we did how to do CMM programming because we do AMDI in my company. So that stands for automatic machine data input. So when we take our CMM programs, we do not manually type the data over into the collection software. Right. It just sends a file. It dumps the file on the server. And every three minutes, I think it searches for new files, automatically fills in all of our metrology information. Sure. And, um, the trace note, the trace fields at the beginning of the program are mm -hmm. crucial to whether or not that works Got because it. it sends it over as a CSV file. So if you are, if your columns are wrong, right, you get garbage. complete garbage yeah. out of the other end. And so, what was the what's the process for that? What sure. did the trace fields look like? What's the first step? So when we got together and we asked everybody, we said, you know, what do you guys think the first step is to writing a proper CMM program? Mm -hmm. And we got answers that were like. Well, you want to go get the model and you want to, you know, make, make sure we have the reports and we have to do this. And I just raised my hand and I went, shouldn't we check to see if we have a program already? <laughs> and everybody was like, ah, that's, that's probably a pretty good place to start. Sure. And so then from there in the SOPs, once you structure that out, it is very, very easy to see where the problems are. Right. Once you have the pieces in front of you. Yeah. So, and you can add like little edits as time goes by. So for that, in that same example, we put a date marker. And so any programs that were written before June of 2023 have to be reprogrammed. Okay. Because we, because all of the changes that we made right. and the new softwares that we use and, and how AMDI, the, the translation files, you know, that was when the latest one got put in. Sure. So anything before then is suspect. And so you don't have to reprogram it from scratch, but we set a date in the SOP that anything prior to this date, you have to take a look at it like it's like a rev change, sure. basically, and bring it up to today's standards. We do the same thing with Mastercam programs as well. And then you you outline that with links and pictures and stuff, and you put yep. it in the task module or the training module? Both. Well, depending on what yeah. it is, if it's a yeah. standalone or if it's a task-driven module, yes. Got it. Yeah. And then we go in and we Your assign... assistant does all that. He does all of it. Great. Um, and then he also does... Um, in ProShop, you have a training matrix and you can go down and assign the trainings by job position. 
-hmm. And so he went in and redefined all the job positions and reattached all the SOPs as trainings. Yeah. So when I hire a new CMM programmer, we put them through the pro shop driven training. And what I get out the other end mm -hmm. is exactly what I'm expecting. Love it. Yeah. I mean, that's the, 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 the and I come back to the EMF, you know, the idea of building this franchise prototype of exactly how you run your business. Mm -hmm. So if you duplicated another branch of it, you know, hundred miles away, right. They could look at how to do it and do it the same way you do it without you having to be there explaining it to them. Right. Right. Well, and, that, and that's a hundred percent on the nose. Uh, my, my thinking behind this was much simpler. How do I scale? I'm trying to scale. I'm trying to grow. Sure. I have a goal. How do I scale the human component here? If you're sitting around waiting for top-notch level three machinists to walk in through your door, those are unicorns. Right. You know, and they're not walking through your door. Their headhunters are finding them and they're they don't move jobs. They get paid handsomely. Sure. And so if you want to grow to a hundred people, you have to grow a hundred people. Mm -hmm. And so you need a good system so that way what you're putting in. You're going to get a consistent result coming out. Yeah. So I'm already teaching these things to people. Sure. So let's document it so we can have a repeatable process. So I'm not the guy that has to teach it for forever. Sure. So and we hold organized classes at the new facility. We built a classroom. Oh, nice. That doubles as a break room. So Thursdays at three o'clock. We most mostly what we do is you know problems that happen on the floor. So like one guy runs into a problem. He's having trouble holding a part flat. Well, there's techniques to holding a part flat. And Cody, poor Cody, mm -hmm. Cody makes my visual aids for me, like content creation, right? Yeah. And then I do like PowerPoint presentations up in the break room nice. and I'll cover two or three subjects every Thursday. So now everybody knows how to hold a part flat or how to keep a part round. That's brilliant. Yep. Scale. Yeah, I know, I know that you said that uh, if your name came up in like, you know, as part of the process. Yeah, it's a bad gotta, process. It's a bad process. Yes, yeah, so I have two remember. rules for making a process. It can't have a person's name in it, especially mine. If you are developing a process and you come to a point in the process where it says, well, when you get to this point, ask Jamie what to do, that's a bad process. And most process, all processes eventually were like that. Right. I, ask Jamie when to start, ask Jamie what to do, right. ask Jamie for the solution. Right. And now I've gotten those down to, this is what you do. This is what you do if you run into trouble. And anytime that we get to where it says, you know, we'll ask Jamie for a solution, we've started changing Jamie to, I prefer the solution. Like, even if it's a little bit more with like work, put the solution there so people can get right to the answer. Mm -hmm. But if it is something where like somebody has to make a, a call, like a judgment call, job titles go there now because okay. job titles are always there, yep. but the people may change, but it still says go to the quality assurance manager for the answer to, for the direction yeah. on what to do here. Yeah. So that's a, and that's the, the second rule. The second rule is any system you build has to be able to scale. Right. And so does it scale and does it have a person's name in it? If it, and if it passes those two, it's probably a decent enough system for a rev. Right. That's awesome. Um, I would love to dig a little bit into the nuance, if you're willing, about <clears throat> that 64% additional revenue that second year. Like, mm -hmm. what were the things that helped you, presumably, keep the spindles turning more often or making less scrap parts or all the things that went into same people, same machines, yep. that much more work? Well, the easiest one is what you and I talked about at the Top Shops conference, which was us drawing a line in the sand between online time and offline time mm -hmm. and how many things in the process could be moved from online, which the line in the sand was when you are actively engaged on the job and you're in front of the machine, right? Right. How many of things could you do offline in preparation? Yeah. And that was part of kind of what Luke was teaching me was how much of this stuff you can do before Right. So if you have a machine, you know, we're scheduling out six to eight weeks, we should have programming, planning, um, inspection planning, <clears throat> CMM programming, because we have an offline seat for that now. Yeah. We should basically be and, uh, hitting up the tools from our new tool crib mm -hmm. and all of that in the fixturing, all of that stuff gets gathered. It all gets done within two weeks of us getting a PO faster if there's an expedite on it. But that's usually the rule that we like to see. Mm -hmm. So now when we have a guy take on a job, he hits the floor running. You know, his tools are there. He puts them in the machine. He probes them all. His fixturing, if we've made it before or if, um, you know, if it was raw, everything mm -hmm. will be supplied to him, like his blanks for his jaws and things sure. like that. So it all gets delivered right to his machine and he's ready to go. So it used to be that I'd give the guy a traveler and tell him, hey, go make this. And so right. he would do all of that. Right. And tooling was all over the place. Um, sure. so I got one guy who loves to collect cool tools. 
<laughs> and so all of the all of the useful tooling was in his toolbox. Right. And there was no reason to fight it because I used to give all of those type of jobs to him anyway. Right. You know, um, we're actually moving him to uh, a newly made prototyping department oh, that, nice. that he's going to get to run, you know, almost like an independent contractor. I'm yeah, gonna give yeah. him, I want to give him the ability. He's been good to me. So his name is Joe. I want to give him the ability to uh, see what he's made out of and like yeah. and give it a go and, and start our prototyping department. So I, we took some of the extra machines that we had and we put them in a corner. Right. And he's going to have a new system built around him that's kind of like outside of the system. Mm -hmm. um, where he doesn't go to the tool crib for his tools. Everything, sure. yeah, it'll just be over there where he's working. Right. You know, we call him our cowboy. He'll just cowboy everything. And yeah. Just get it out the door. Yeah. That is a wise thing to do. We, uh, at our shop, we had um, ultimately about five or six people in a dedicated prototype department. They, they got those jobs that ultimately would turn into production, but they, the way they did things was incredible. Like they'd receive a model they program the roughing pass, stick a piece of material in and start cutting yeah. while they're programming this, the finish and the, the semi-roughing. And yeah, you know, we do that like, sometimes too. Like drip feeding the program. Right. It's so Just proving it out one section at a time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We'll yeah. do that sometimes. And too. they use Monday ProShop, day. but they didn't, they used it differently. Yeah. Right? They didn't go to the same level of detail. They may take one picture of a setup just so they kind of knew what it looked like. So we put him as a resource. So the right. schedule, the schedule looks at him like he's a machine because he could use any one of well, because we don't care. So the machine, his machines are not on the schedule at all. I don't care what he right. does with them, right? right. They're his. Yeah. And so, what's the bottleneck? What's the bottleneck on how fast the production is going to come out? It's whatever he can work on. Right. So we just put him as the resource, yeah. and then we schedule it to him. He's got his own line on the schedule. Yeah, yeah. And so we're like, well, how quickly can we get this out? Well, when's Joe going to be free? Right. Right. Oh, he's not going to be free for two weeks. Well, that's when we can get it out. Sure. Right. And it doesn't matter how many resources he uses. Yeah. And that's actually a new mentality that I learned from you from the, your pro CNC days, that bar to box thing. Yeah. So in the new shop, when I did the layout, I did the layout. So that way, one person can use as many resources as they want to. Mm. But like it doesn't matter anymore. Just right. you want three machines, you op one, op two, op three, instead of flowing in machine. Right. I put the machines in a way where um, two different people get six machines and you can flow as however you would like. And when right. there's extra machines, I don't care. Let them sit if that's what you got to do. Right. You know, it stop chasing them. We've learned sure. that um, we get more done with less. When, and that when, when we start to really slow down and production starts to kind of sputter, it's usually because we're trying to do too much. Right. Right. We're trying to get we're behind schedule. We're trying to get caught up. We're moving jobs around in ways that we shouldn't be doing. And uh, I listened very well when when Luke was explaining how it worked mm -hmm. and that because uh, my first instinct was that we would put out less product. Right. And he's like, well, at a minimum, you would put out the same product. You would just right. when you start something, you would finish it faster and then yeah, faster. And then you would start something else and also finish it. Right. And uh, I'm very excited to see what this mm -hmm. is going to do to cash flow. Right. So. That's cool. Um, so this idea of online offline, that's not unique to Pro Shop. Obviously, that's a it's more of a lean concept than anything. Yep. Um, obviously, we have things like the pre-processing checklist and some functions that help support that. Is that what just? I mean, you could have been doing that years ago with Job Boss. I right? could have had a tool crib. Yeah, we could have had uh, quality control documentation. We could. There's a lot of things we could have done. Right. Um, I think the thing that goes forgotten is that everyone starts their journey based on where they've previously been, right? So if you worked at an aerospace shop and then, yeah, of course, you're going to start a shop like an aerospace shop. That is not where I came from. I came from a down and dirty shop where we took machines apart and rebuilt them and put them back together. And, okay. you know, um, I remember I thought the guy I used to work for back then was nuts, but he took in a like one of those claws that has the magnet in it that they okay. use to like scrap things. Yeah. And we took that thing apart in the backyard and one finger at a time brought it in with a fork truck, put it on the boring mill and reboard and bushed it and put it back into service. And they had to like bring it back piece by piece on a tow truck. Wow. Right. And so I liked that guy. He taught me that you can literally do anything. Right. You know, you just have to believe you can do it. And right. if you can do it and somebody's willing to pay you to get it done, 
you can do anything. <laughs> so I wanted to be very brave, which yeah. at the beginning of my career was a detriment. But now that I've kind of learned how to control it, I find it to be an asset because now I'm looking at aerospace parts, right? And they're like sure. this big and they're really crazy. And I'm like, I think we can make it. We have the ability, we can, tr we can, we have the programming and we have the inspection equipment. Right. If they're willing to pay the right money for it. And I think we can make a profit on it, then we'll take it in. Sure. So how, uh, I guess that's a good segue. How has your usage of ProShop uh, change the way you sell or the types of clients you're able to get into or anything in that sort of realm? Well, it, well, I've used it to show people like how we manage our shop. Right. And so from a guy that came from a place that really wasn't be the shop wasn't being managed at all mm -hmm. and realizing just how many shops there really are like that out there. And then there's everything in between. Sure. So you you walk into a customer and I pull my phone out and I show them like, here's our schedule and, you know, this is what our work orders look like. And this is why when you call, you know, I, I just need a little bit of info from you. What PO are we talking about? What part are we talking about? And I can tell you everything you need to know about that part, where it's at, when I'm expecting it back. And buyers and managers and planners really appreciate the level of understanding that you have about your business, mm -hmm. um, that they really like that. Yeah, I've I've long um, been of the opinion that uh, fancy machines are great and all, but an OEM that's going to trust you with you know hundred thousand dollar orders or just you know lots of they want to know that you have the systems in place to deliver and not put their production mm -hmm. line at risk. That's right. So when you show them you have really good digital systems that you have access to no matter where you are, yep. you know they it builds that level of confidence at least you know, good enough for them to take a leap sure. you know, so that way they can give you one order, two orders so you can show what you're made out of. Yeah. yeah. So it's been a really good tool for selling. Um, and not only that, but then we know how much we can take. Sure. Right. So now we have, a, we're doing a much better job of scheduling and, and um, we just hired our first, we're, we're building out our sales department right now. Nice. We have, uh, we have room at the new building and we made an office and uh, we yeah. just hired our first VP of sales. And yeah. Thank awesome. you. He started March 1st and he's remote a couple of days and in office a couple of days. Yep. So we gave him a seat to the software and he's, and we showed him how to get around and from home, he has unbelievable visibility as right. to what's going on in the company. Right. And, and he goes, Hey, we're going to be late on these things, you know, and he's not waiting for anybody to answer. You know, is there anything I need to know about this? Right. Yeah. It's my fault. You know, right. and he goes, okay, good. And then he just goes and he handles it. Sure. You know, over, over communicating. That's what we're, I, quality control. I put a lot of time and effort into building that system, yeah. and now it works very well. Yeah. And so now I'm working on sales, and he he loved the VP of sales has never seen the system. You know, right. you want to know who really appreciates the system? Is that uh, potential employees? Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, when you when you finally do get a high level unicorn type employee to come in. Yeah. And um, for example, I just hired a new ops manager. Okay. And he came on board and during the interview, you know, I'm just showing him, you know, he has, here's how things work here and, you know, our expectations and what I think will be your responsibilities and stuff. And he's, he's just, his jaws on the floor. He goes, you know, how long that would have taken all of the different things you just pulled up and showed me, you know, how long that would have taken in my last job, right. that would have been a week, right. you know, and no, and nobody would have found any of that data. Right. I was like, oh, it's right here. It's right on my computer. Right. Just click it. Like, this is what to do. This <laughs> is where we back. are. Yeah, yeah. It's, and that's, got, it's almost boring for you. Now. It it really has, and and I'm serious about it. Like when we when I get together with some of my old guard, I got some guys. I have a guy that's been with me for ten years, right. and we talk about the changes that you know we've seen in the last ten years. You know, he goes, I have no, I can't remember how it worked before this. Right. You know, and because you, as humans, we tend to forget chaotic and negative things so yeah mm -hmm. you just put that in the past because it was it was bad sure it really was but we just didn't know any better right you know and we got really really good at responding so now we use that you know so we're good mm -hmm. at responding we're good at we're clutch mm -hmm. we just have much better systems now so we don't have to use it as often does it uh i know that when you were talking about the 2022 and more profitability um i know that you you uh bought an RV and went on vacation more than that you had ever been done before. Yeah, and I took like five weeks off that year, five weeks off. Yep. And so you were really kind of feeling the impact on a personal family level. Yes. It, it was, it was really great, you know, and, and I can work from the camper. Sure. So I got with the phone company and I got on, 
throttleable data. So, right. you know, it's unlimited and they can't turn me down. And I just tether into my laptop yeah. and I, right, I'm like, I'm there. I got a VPN right. and the system can't tell that I'm not there. So right. I just, I'm like, oh, fixing the schedule. How's this running? How's that running? Right. You know, moving things around, making sure things are getting ordered, you know, yeah. and my, and my wife is the same thing, right? So she's right. doing a lot of material purchasing, communications back and forth with the customers and, and with the people who are at the shop running. So that's made that really, really nice. So that, you know, we, we get to enjoy the RV. Right. Um, now, 2023 was a humbling year. Yeah. Um, and so 2022, we were like, yeah, we made it. It's amazing. You know, it's going to flow like wine now. And 2023 was like, you're not there yet. Just remember to keep it humble. Right. So, um, you know, everything happens for a reason. So sure. A little, little slap of reality. Yeah. Yeah. But 2024 is off to a better start. 2024 looks like it's going to be a record year. So, yeah. and I, I think the only thing that's going to hold back the, the, the numbers of it being a record year is the move. Because we're gonna, we're gonna be down for a couple of weeks, and you know, sure. and and that's unpredictable. It's sure. Like, as good as I am at logistics, as soon as we unplug, right. anything could happen. Yeah. So, so uh, as we kind of start to wrap up here, you know, the name of this podcast and our team went back and forth with names for a long time, but it's called Manufacturing Transformed: mm -hmm. Real Shops, Real Stories. Um, you've been talking about a lot of transformation. I guess if you had to kind we're of we're not even the same company, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it, it was a, it, it created a new mindset of like, if we didn't know this much then, right. Imagine what we still don't know. Right. So it became part of who we are now is we don't know anything. We just approach everything that way now. Right. We just don't, we, maybe we don't know. So we go into all of these things open-minded. And so I would actually say that we're three new companies from 2020, you know, the transformation of pro shop, the, and then, a lot of the other changes that we've made as we now we had a new infrastructure. And so now you start going back around and, and kind of reevaluating all of the systems and, and fixing them, yep. you know, using um, like if you were a coder, you know, you're using a new language now, a, right. a more robust programming language. And so you can right. do so much more than you could do before because you were so limited by Got your it. language and, yeah. and how things would have been built. Um, so I would say we're probably three different companies than we were in 2020. And I think after the move and the expansion, it'll, it's going to be completely different as well. Yeah. Awesome. Um, anything I haven't asked that you think is pertinent to share and just kind of talk about the journey over the last four years with us? I've never met a group of people who were, I really felt, especially at the very beginning, I really felt like the people who worked at Pro Shop worked at Marzelli Machine. Yeah, I know you said Luke was like, yeah, and you as well. Yeah. I mean, um, I've never had you not answer the call, uh, answer my phone, right? And I, I, I call less and less and less now. I know how busy that you are, um, but yeah, like especially then at the beginning when like everything was on the line, I felt like you guys were in our corner, and. Yeah, I complain a lot of other software companies now because they just they don't they don't come with the same bag of tricks, you know, like the and I think that that's a reflection of the the ownership team at this company. Um, you know, you're like one of the nicest humans I've ever met. You know, and I'm from New England. We're all we're all jerks. <laughs> and, I'm uh, from New Jersey, so <laughs> well, but you, maybe you've been out here in, the, in this specific air for too long. I don't know, but uh, you and Kelsey and Luke, some of the nicest people I've ever met super smart, super deep technical understanding of this world because you're machinists who built a software to solve a problem. Everybody going at this is the opposite. Right. They have a software and they're looking for a place to apply it. Right. Right. So they build these sky blotting softwares that no one understands and you call them and they're like, I don't know, I got to talk to nine other people. It's $300 an hour to get you an answer. You know, and what they don't understand is that I'm bleeding to death while I'm waiting for this answer. You right. know, um, what did we say in Top Shop? Death by a thousand paper cuts. Yeah. Right. Well, you're bleeding though. You know, and I'm I'm just waiting for somebody to help. And I never felt not one time that I was on my own, and that if there was a problem with the system, or even a lot of the things I called and I talked to Luke about back then were just like problems with like best practice. What is right. the best practice to do this? Like how, right. when you guys built this, how did you, what was going on? 
Right. You know, and he would give me really good answers and, and good descriptions of like how the flow worked. Right. And it changed my mentality of like what was possible for us as a company. So I would say that the transformation really here was not a transformation of Marzilli Machine, but the transformation of Jamie as the president of Marzilli Machine mm -hmm. to become more open minded and to and to be able to learn more about, you know, I'm a really, really good machinist. And so I had to learn how to become that same level as a business owner. And so I had to just open my mind up and just let it happen. Right. So I don't know how to convince other business owners to do that. I've met all types. Mm -hmm. And some a part of me suspects that the ones who are going to do that right. will just do it and that you don't have to help them. Sure. So, you know, how do you help the unhelpable? Yeah. Um, you kind of have to wait till they hit rock bottom, I think. And then, and that's cause that's where I was. That's what led to that change mm -hmm. was that I, I was like, well, this can't get any worse. And I'm thinking sure. I might just go back to work, right. um, you know, and just get out of the rat race of this. When I, after the change, I, I would never go back now. You know, it, it runs well. Like I, I can see what's happening when it doesn't run well, I can right. see what's happening. So I know how to make the changes. I, I understand it now. Yeah. So that that's the real transformation that the implementation made was it changed me. Well, to go from thinking you might just go get a machining job somewhere to having, you know, a goal to have 100 people and 20 million in revenue, that's that's a, it's it's incredible. And it's humbling to be able to be a partner in your journey of, of getting there. So, Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate you being here. I'm really glad to be here. Yeah. I'm very happy for your success as well, Paul. You and Kelsey and the whole pro shop team. And uh, that's why I come and I participate. I think everybody should know about this. It's yeah. It could change their lives. It changed my life personally. You know, those five weeks of vacation, anybody who's in this mess, um, you know, running a shop, to be able to take that kind of time off and actually enjoy it, yeah, it's, it's worth more than money, Yeah, you know? Well, thank you for coming out. Appreciate you flying out here. And, of course. Uh, um, yeah. Here's to the next uh, four and plus years of your journey. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Paul. Hey there, buddy. How's it going? Oh, man. I'm excited to talk to you. I love hearing about your meetings with clients, your exploits. Uh, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. So when we had our client advisory board, Jamie uh, Marzilli was here on site, and we decided to shoot the, the Manufacturing Transformed episode together. So it was super fun. We sat right here where, where I normally sit. Um, we had our director's chairs actually we used for the TK video that we made. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> the director's chairs. Nice. <laughs> it was really fun. Um, but man, you know, you know, I I knew that when we created this podcast and called it Manufacturing Transformed, it was truly going to be about stories of transformation. And, you know, you know Jamie well enough and you know Marzilli Machine well enough at this point that that is what the story is about, right? Oh, when absolutely. he not only, you know, his usage of pro shop, um, but like when he was he talking about how pro shop was really like taking a college level course in how to run a machine shop, right? He felt like he knew it beforehand. And he's like, I didn't know crap. Like I, you know, <laughs> it was, it was such a, an education and it wasn't just the software. It was the business processes that the software is built on. And, um, you know, Luke was his trainer and he, uh, he talks about, um, you know, even just the concepts of doing one piece flow and how to do that in pro shop, like how to structure the, the part level and how to pro, you know, structure work orders. So things like flow, you know, start to finish in one flow. And he's like, I decided to start doing that and I shipped way more parts faster, you know? So that's just yeah. amazing. That and even just, music. uh, just, um, is, you know, the tooling crib, this is a common story with many shops is like their tooling is just a mess. Uh, they have tools all over the whole company. And then, you know, but he was pretty decisive after, after hearing it a few times from Luke, he was like, all right, fine. I'm just going to build a tool crib. So he went on the weekend, like tore the whole place apart, put, told all the tools from everyone's boxes, brought it into one spot, and then had one person go through and like catalog it and photo it and get it in the system. And, uh, and it's amazing how much better things got, you know, once ah. tooling was under control. So just so many stories like that. Oh yeah. And he's very decisive. He's a, he's a go-getter. He's a man of action for sure. So it's, uh, it was just a really fun conversation and, uh, yeah, just reinforces that, uh, 
the impact can be huge. And it's just so great to support people like this that are good, good human beings doing their best, doing great, but still with better tools, they can do even better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, having talked with Jamie over the years, he's, uh, you know, you said a man of decisive action and he's <laughs> done that over and over again, you know, and, and with various oh, yeah. different processes and various things that, you know, he's really learned and chosen to do well. And I think that, uh, you know, the tooling module is a good example. And then I think he's even, you know, diving in really deep on making sure that trainings and tasks are all super well documented. You'd mentioned yes. something about that. Yeah. He, uh, he hired an assistant. I think he's the only, like, you know, uh, the only machine shop owner I know that has like an EA, um, <laughs> nice. maybe, but, uh, he, you know, and that was also something he learned from us. Um, and yeah, that person is going through and documenting in the tasks module, in the training module, step-by-step -step photographic pictures and arrows and really deep on every SOP in the whole company. So they can nice. hire someone and get them up to speed incredibly quickly, um, yeah. which, which wow. I think is super wise. It's an investment, clearly. You know, it's a, it's a longer term and payoff, but uh, every company out there is ha having a hard time finding talented, not maybe not talented, but skilled, experienced people in the industry. So if they can hire someone with that's eager and has some grit and determination to learn and do great, yeah. get them to the S SOPs and they can be up and running fast. Right. And and I think that, you know, the way that it's set up and the way that uh, I've heard Jamie doing it, those very same people, you know, six months later are the ones rewriting the next version that's even better than the version they walked into six 100%. months ago. Right? And that's like yeah. the, that's like that flywheel of things just continually improving. You know, once yeah. you set a baseline, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't disappear. It keeps getting better for everyone. Yeah. And then the one last thing I want to share, he said, you know, he works with many different software vendors and he said, pro shops, customer support sets the bar like unrealistically high and it's not fair to all the other <laughs> all the other software companies so not fair we to can all be, the other companies. so we can be proud of our team for doing such nice. an incredible job yeah oh that is that's awesome and and i know jamie well enough to know that he uh he doesn't give that kind of praise lightly it's only oh, no. if you've actually earned it so that's, sure. that's big praise coming from him wow yeah. cool buddy that sounds like a good one i sorry i wasn't there in person i uh, i know you're on vacation to... so yeah, yeah well, well that you... wasn't so bad <laughs> we'll get you on one of these interviews soon enough so awesome well anyway great catching up and uh, thanks for sharing the success yeah thanks All for right. doing it with jamie that's awesome you bet cheers man